session. So this will be recorded um, and you will be able to access it later on our website. This will help folks who have not yet, um, who aren't able to attend right now, but wanna see this information later. Um, but just so you all know, uh, this is being recorded. Um, we're still getting those beeps rolling in. So again, just for the good of the order, um, you are all on mute. Um, and if you could keep your videos off for the preservation of bandwidth, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, as you can see, Gregory Foster also um, let folks know that they will be independently recording this as well. So I suppose there will be two recordings available. Um, so uh, just so you know how today is going to go on, I'm going to give a presentation. Um, Jessica Allenton, the assistant director from our commodity inspection division is also going to be presenting with me. Um, and then at the end, we're gonna have time for question and answer. Uh, because we are in this online format, the question and answer will occur in the chat box. So there is a chat box that should be on the lower right corner for you um, and you can chat in your questions. Um, Jessica is going to be moderating that chat box. Um, just so you know, uh, you'll need to post your question to everyone because if you just post it to me, I'm the only person who will see it and Jessica will not see it. She's the one moderating the questions. Um, you can also, you should be able to send a question to Jessica as well. Um, but just know that your questions will be in the chat box. While we would love to answer all of your questions today, we A, might not have time and B, might not know the answers. Um, I'm perfectly comfortable with letting you know what I don't know. So if I just don't have an answer for you, then it's something that we'll follow up on. So anything that you put into the chat box we will work on getting an answer for you. It doesn't mean that we're gonna have it today. Um, so put your questions into the chat box as they come up for you, and we will have time at the end to go over your questions. Um, so still having those beeps roll in. That's always exciting. I'm glad you all came. Um, so we're gonna get this going and um, I'm now going to engage in transition of sharing the PowerPoint on the internet. So just bear with me for just a few minutes while I get our PowerPoint going. Okay, so it does look like I'm having trouble sharing my content because of the amount of bandwidth that is occurring in here. So if everyone could please turn off their video, hopefully that will help us um, to get that bandwidth back. But we are at current over bandwidth to share. So let's just hold.
And just so everybody knows, we're just having some bandwidth issues. We are in the process of getting our PowerPoint up and running. But if everyone could please turn off their videos, that would be great. That way we have bandwidth preservation. Great, we have Jessica to the rescue with our PowerPoint. Thank you, Jessica. <laughs> um, okay, so we're just gonna get this moving since we have our PowerPoint going. Um, and this is our first presentation of the year as the Washington State Department of Agriculture's Hemp Program. Um, I am Tricia Ehrlich, I'm the Hemp Program Manager. I'll tell you a little bit more about myself later, but um, for today, we're just going to go over what the hemp program is, what it has been, what it will be, um, and what the timeline for you looks like as people who are producing hemp or otherwise interested in hemp. Um, so we can move to that next slide. Great. And so this is a webinar series. When um, we originally kind of imagined what this might look like, we were thinking about having a hemp conference. Um, and then in the world that we are currently in, uh, the global pandemic COVID-19 world, we realized that we probably weren't going to get together in a room and have a day of exciting activities. So it made a little bit more sense to take advantage of this online format and do a multi-part webinar series so that we could have different folks from different areas of WSDA present to you and give you an idea of um, what different programs interact with hemp in these more palatable or bite-sized kind of information divisions. Um, oh, Jessica, we do see your chat right now. Uh, there we go. And so, um, we are going to move forward. Oh, okay. I will work on that. Um, and so what we are going to do is have a four part series. And the first one is right now, we're going to go over the hemp program in and of itself. And then the next one will be next Wednesday. That's going to start a little earlier from 930 to 12. Um, and we're going to have presentations and Q&A from our pesticide division and our organic certification division. So for folks who have questions related to pesticides and organic certification as it relates to hemp, um, that will be next Wednesday on the 24th. 
Then the following Wednesday, we're going to have presentations from our plant services division, and that's nursery, licensing, quarantine, and certified seed. So we get a lot of hemp related questions on the seed front, also related to phytosanitary certificates, and that will be really helpful on um, the 31st from 10 to 12. And then our final uh, presentation will be on April 7th, and that is from 1 to 3 p.m. Um, and that is going to have just a little bit more time for Q&A. Um, and it's from marketing and food safety on exports, as well as a CBD update from the food safety division. Um, and so that is any questions about exporting out of the state, out of the country, um, any questions people have about CBD and foods and where that stands, that will be our final April 7th. Um, and so right now, this webinar series is on WebEx. That is the provider that we're using. Um, that's the platform. However, I should just note that um, we might be changing to Microsoft Teams just because the, the big uh, hope with this was to have bandwidth and an unlimited amount of participants, but it looks like we're not going to surpass the threshold. So we might be using Microsoft Teams in the future. Um, and uh, just know that uh, I will send up out an updated meeting link if we are going to have um, a change. And so now for our next slide. Um, and this is us. I'm Tricia Ehrlich. I'm the Hemp Program Manager. I started in this role um, in August of this year, or August of 2020. Um, prior to that, I was at the Liquor and Cannabis Board as a research consultant for almost three years. I started in 2017. Um, and prior to that, I was at the University of Washington working on my master's in public health, where I did a study on the occupational health and safety of cannabis farm workers. So I've been in this cannabis plant space for a few years now, but I'm new to the Department of Agriculture. And now I will introduce our assistant director, Jessica Allenton. Jessica, are you here? Yes, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. I am Jessica Allenton. I'm the assistant director for the Commodity Inspection Division here at WSDA. Um, so I oversee five programs, one of which is the hemp program. Um, so I work very closely with Tricia on um, just kind of oversight um, and making sure that we're meeting our regulatory obligation. Tricia is your main contact and um, she's she's really the, the one managing the program, but um, I provide that support and oversight. Uh, additionally, we do have um, two admin staff that are not full-time with the program here at the division headquarters level that spend a part of their time helping with the hemp program because it is such a small program. Um, there's only one full-time employee, which is Tricia, uh, but all of us, um, as, as we can for, for funding and for capacity, we, we jump in and help her with with managing that program. So thank you all for joining us. This is exciting. Great, thank you. Um, so what we'll go over today, we're gonna go over uh, the hemp program. So as some of you know, this is a very new program. Um, so we'll, we'll go over where it came from and where it's going. We'll also go over a timeline in the year of a hemp producer, how you're going to interact with our program um, and your different obligations as a hemp producer. Um, and then we'll go into harvest inspections, the sampling and testing. And we'll also go into our changes for the 2021 growing season, um, the USDA final rule changes. Uh, so as you know, we had an interim final rule and now we have the actual final rule. Um, our own rule updates and policy statement updates and our new license application software. Um, and so uh, from there, we'll go to our next slide. And I'll let Jessica take over for this one. Perfect. And I am going to pull up my notes. So I hopefully it will show up on my screen and on all of your screens. Okay, perfect. I think we still have it. Um, so just a little bit about um, the history of the hemp program. 
for those that haven't been um, here with us since the beginning of the pilot program. In 2014, the Farm Bill, the Federal Farm Bill allowed State Departments of Agriculture to create hemp pilot programs. Um, because of that, uh, Washington legislature, so just a little bit about the process, sorry, backing up. Anytime there's legislation at the federal level that allows the states to do something like um, this Farm Bill or the 2018 Farm Bill, which we'll talk about, states um, still have to follow their own legislative process in order to give agencies the authority to do something with that legislation. So in 2014, the federal government gave uh, state departments of agriculture the authority to create pilot programs. We then had um, a, a bill passed uh, into law here in Washington. We went through the rulemaking process uh, in six in 2016. 2017 was the first growing season um, where we licensed uh, growers, processors, and seed distributors. And we actually called it like processor marketers. Um, because the, the hemp, hemp products and hemp itself was so heavily regulated, um, there, there was a lot of oversight at that time. Um, one of the current struggles that we had uh, in 17 is we had seven licensees, but we had no processors. So um, at that time in the pilot program, you could not move state across state lines. I had to stay within Washington. And because we had no processors, that first year, it was a real big struggle for, for the seven licensees that we had. In um, 2018, the program stayed pretty small uh, as we awaited some changes and what that looked like in, in the farm bill. One of the big issues that we ran into with the pilot program were uh, we had uh, legislation that was passed that limited hemp for human consumption. So no, no CBD at all, only things that could be used for con consumption, including, you know, topical um, or inhalation was just hemp seed. Uh, so that really limited the amount of folks that were interested in participating in the hemp program at that time. Um, so in 2019, based on the 2018 Farm Bill, which removed industrial hemp from the Schedule 1 list and provided the United States Department of Agriculture the ability to regulate hemp, we had um, industry advocated and really pushed legislation for us, which we're, we're grateful for um, in order to allow us to develop a program uh, to submit to USDA for approval under that 2018 Farm Bill. Um, again, because we have to have authority to do, you know, to change from the pilot program to, to the program that we had now. Additionally, the legislation um, helped uh, remove language around CBD al allowance for human consumption. And also um, we had a, a, a buffer requirement, a, a mileage buffer from marijuana, which was removed, which was helpful for folks. So a lot of changes in 2019, and we had a huge, a huge increase in participa uh, participation in the program because of it. We had 135 licensees that year, um, which is huge from seven, the, the first two years. Uh, to blow up. We definitely um, appreciated everybody's patience as we went through that process of, of bulking up because of that time. And well, and up until this year, we were doing everything paper and manually. So it was quite the process. Okay, so the because the 2018 Farm Bill uh, allowed U USDA to regulate hemp, um, what we had to do is we had to submit a state plan for regulating hemp to USDA for approval. And USDA um, has that authority to approve or, or deny uh, state departments of agriculture the ability to regulate hemp. Um, so as we were going through that process and that rulemaking, um, one of the things that we, was an, we were unclear about was what USDA's rules were actually going to be. The USDA, the, the interim final rule was published on October 31st of 2019. One of the challenges that we had at that time was the 2019 legislation here in Washington state had an expiration date for the pilot program in statute. So the, the date that we were given was January 1st of 2020, um, which it was a very fast turnaround then from uh, getting the rules on October 31st 2019 to them making sure that we had a program that we could submit and that folks could continue growing hemp in Washington 
IOPT by January 1st. So some of the, the challenges from the IFR um, that we had was there was no options, options for remediation. There was a 15 day testing period. In the pilot program previously, we had done a 30 day testing period. So that was, that was quite um, a challenge there. And then also USDA included a DEA registration for labs that were testing hemp. Um, we did provide comments. So the comment period closed um, October 8th of 2020, I believe. And then we, um, so we did submit some comments there. Just a, a point of note, we did receive our state, our approval for our state plan in February of 2020. Um, that was really exciting. We definitely weren't the first state that got it, um, but we were we were pretty close. I would I would say top uh, first ten um, is is, a, is great um, to have that. And the the big thing there was it allowed the program to it allowed you as growers to continue um, growing hemp while we were um, waiting on USDA to do their final rule. Tricia, I believe this one's yours. Yeah, so I'll jump back in. Um, so uh, January 19th, 2021, it was essentially right before the change in administration, the USDA published their final rule. Um, and that rule does become effective next week on March 22nd. Um, so the USDA accepted comment on their final rule. We submitted comments based on our experience in the 2020 growing season and comments that we heard from you. Um, and we were pleased that they did listen to a lot of the feedback that we offered, not all of it, but um, a whole lot of it. Um, so that 15 day inspection window did get pushed back to 30 days. So. Those of you who grew last year, you'll recall that we needed to come in and inspect your crop within a 15 day window of your harvest period. Um, and that made it particularly hard in our first year because as some of you know, you were all figuring it out. We were figuring it out on our end. So, um, you know, it was not uncommon to get the phone call saying, I'm harvesting in three days. Can you come out here? <laughs> to do the inspection. Um, so it just made it a really tight timeline for us to get out and get our inspectors out to have timely inspections for you. So having a 30 day window, um, your crops will be a little bit less mature and it also just gives us more time on our end to schedule. It also means that we'll be able to like visit more farms in a given geographic area in one day, which will save time and mileage costs because it is a big expense for us to drive out to each individual farm. So when we have a bigger window of time, it means that we can say, okay, we're gonna go inspect 15 farms in Spokane today or 10 farms in Yakima. And it just makes it a little bit easier for us to schedule. So we were really pleased that that window went back to 30 days. Um, the final rule also adds options for remediation of quote unquote hot hemp. And hot hemp is anything greater than 0.3% THC. Um, last year, there were no remediation options. We could retest, um, but I will say it was pretty rare. Once someone tests hot, their, their crops usually stay in hot. Um, sometimes you did see people who are just barely over that threshold and a different sample would test lower. Um, but for the most part, you were seeing that once people tested hot, they were staying hot. Um, and they would have to destroy their crop, burn it, till it, mow it under the soil. It is not fun for farmers and it's really not fun for us either. Um, we really wanted to farmers to have other options. And so now there will be an option for remediation of hot hemp. Um, and there, there are actually a, a few options. One is disposing of the flower material and utilizing other components of the plant. And the other is like blending the entire plant into a kind of mulch mix in which you then would take a sample of the whole plant um, and retest it. And I'm seeing in the chat, burn it. I thought that was a no-go. 
Um, that is generally a no-go just based on fire restrictions that we've had in our state. Um, however, depending on, you know, there are some places where folks live where, you know, this past harvest uh, burning was a no-go because we had a lot of fires going on. Um, but technically, from the USDA's perspective, burning is an option depending on where you live um, and, and what exactly is going on. Um, based on our harvest period, it will be um, unlikely that burning is a viable option for us. Um, we also increased the negligence threshold. That's the USDA increased the negligence threshold from 0 0.5 to 1% THC. So what that negligence threshold meant was that essentially if someone um, had a crop that was 0.6% THC, the USDA would have defined that as negligent and had a negligent violation given to that producer. We actually didn't give out any negligence thresholds this past um, season because we do have our own authority and like enforcement oversight. Um, you know, we had, it was our first year, we had a lot of new farmers. Um, we had some who had seed that um, they wish they didn't have, but I certainly didn't meet anyone um, who I perceived to be negligent or um, have, you know, intentional malintent when, when their plant came up hot. Um, but the USDA did increase that threshold to 1% THC. So they were not defining negligence between 0.5 and 1 now. Um, we will still maintain our own authority to, to use our best understanding of circumstances for what's going on with folks, whether it's an education need or like a violation need. And we tend to veer in the um, mode of education whenever possible. Um, someone asked, has disposing of flour and utilizing the rest of the plant been successful in reducing from hot to okay? Yeah, oftentimes it is the flowers of the plant that have um, the most THC in them. And so if people are using stalk stems and leaves instead, uh, that should lower the, uh, the THC. Um, but uh, we haven't actually tested this circumstance because this is going to be, this upcoming year will be the first year that that is available to us as an option. Um, and so the other big thing that has been a challenge to us was the DEA registration requirement for testing laboratories. And this is just to be perfectly honest, still an arena that we're trying to wrap our heads around and figure out what the next steps are. So um, the USDA has required that the laboratories testing hemp are registered with the DEA. Um, what we have found is that this presents a challenge in states where um, higher THC producing cannabis is legal because those labs test for high THC cannabis um, and the DEA has historically restricted um, those labs from registering with the DEA, meaning that if you're testing THC, high THC cannabis, then you are not eligible for DEA registration, which of course is um, kind of a conflict in a state like ours where the people who have the most experience testing hemp um, are the people who are also testing for high THC cannabis. So we don't know if them, if the maintenance of this DEA registration requirement means that they will um, relax their standards around allowing um, cannabis labs to participate in the DEA registration uh, program or not. And that's information that we're still trying to understand as we wrap our heads around this final rule. Um, but there is a delay until December of 2022 as far as the implementation. So we're hoping that we'll be able to um, make, make something work so that we have that requirement in place when it is necessary. Um, and now we can move forward. So how will implement the USDA final rule? Um, basically, the, the USDA final rule has some 
basically increased leniencies in it that we want available to our farmers as soon as possible. Um, the rulemaking process tends to be a bit lengthier. It just takes some time to um, think about the best way to codify new standards and procedures and um, get feedback from the public and uh, holistically about how we want to change the rules that exist for the hemp program now that we're a little ways down the road and have a little bit more experience. Um, that being said, we don't want to wait for those rule changes to um, create some more lenient policies that will make next year's harvest more easier for our farmers right away. So we'll be implementing policy statements um, over the probably next few weeks or you know month to two months. And that will, for example, make it such that for folks who are harvesting, they can have their crop inspected in that 30 day window instead of that 15 day window um, to make things easier on farmers, easier on us. And then simultaneously, we'll get the ball rolling on rule changes so that you know all of these changes become formalized and finalized in our rule. That process will just take a little bit longer. Um, next slide. Here we go. Okay. Um, a year in the life of a hemp producer. So, so far every year has been really unique just because it is a new program. So, um, we'll give you kind of the timeline and while the timeline is filled with lots of asterisks, um, because we are still just working out the details. Um, so, in a typical year, our application period opens on January 1st for new licensees and for license renewals. Um, and this year, that was a little bit different because we were implementing new software. Um, and so, it, you know, but typically our application period opens on January 1st. I will say we accept applications all year round. So any time of the year that you want to apply to the hemp program, you can apply. It's just that typically speaking, we have like a, a regular time period in which we accept applications. And then typically speaking, we have what is considered a quote unquote late application period. Um, and we charge a little bit more for that late application period. So, in a typical year after March 31st, it goes into our late application period. Um, and that means that applications cost an additional $200. But this year, because we were implementing a new licensing and regulatory software system, we are not having any late fees. So, you can apply to the hemp program at any time for our $1,200 fee until March 31st, 2022, that's March 31st of next year, 2022. And then starting there, applications received after March 31st will incur the late fee. So you can apply anytime, but our typical application season is between January 1st and March 31st. Um, hey, Teresa. Then, oh, yeah. I think it's also important to note here um, that while they can, they can apply at any time for a license. The the license does expire. Everybody's license expires at the same time. So mm -hmm. somebody that applies and gets a license in October, um, you're still paying the the application fee and the late fee at that point, and you will still have to then reapply um, during the application window because all of the licenses expire. Um, what is it? End of April of of each year. Yeah, so definitely important point. It um the it becomes less efficient to um to share the um or it, it becomes less efficient to apply during certain periods of time for you, particularly if you're an outdoor farmer. So I've had some um outdoor farmers who have called me in November saying, you know, can I apply? And I say, yes, you, you certainly can apply, but it might kind of be a misuse of your funds if you're not going to be putting roots in the ground until April. Just wait until January, 
fill out your application in January. That way you get a full kind of like 16 month licensure period. Um, and you don't have to worry about relicensing before you're even putting flour in the ground. That being said, I've also talked to indoor farmers in November who say, oh, I'm planning on, you know, planting and having multiple cycles before um, multiple harvests before the April 30th. So it makes sense for me to license now. So that's just kind of a, a decision you'll have to make and we can talk through it if you're trying to figure out when is the right time for you to license. Um, in April, that's when planting typically starts for the outdoor folks. So y'all stay pretty busy um, during this time and there aren't too many uh, regulatory happenings occurring unless you're an indoor farmer and maybe you're Harvesting, in which case, um, I can, you know, we can work out a harvest inspection. Um, so, 1 thing that we noticed a lot of farmers missed out on this year is FSA reporting. You are supposed to report your acreage to the farm service agency. That is a USDA requirement. Um, farm service agencies are typically local. So they're like a county agency. Um. I call the agency in my county. The reporting is due July 15th. Um, and so typically what you'll do is give just a call to your local farm service agency. Um, there's one in Yakima, there's one in King County. And if you planted five acres, you'll say, I planted five acres of hemp. Um, if you planted 100 acres, you'll say, I planted 100 acres of hemp, whatever it may be. Um, so, at least last year, July, August, those were the first months that we started hearing some trickles of folks harvesting. Um, we, I'm going to say that we're going to ask that you submit your harvest inspection request uh, 45 days prior to your anticipated harvest date. We got a lot of late harvest inspection requests, and I'll just just to forewarn you, the earlier we get your request, the easier it is for us to schedule an inspection for you. Um, very late requests often means that we might have to pull out in an inspector that we don't have scheduled and that ends up making it typically more costly because you have to pay for the time and mileage of your inspection. So the earlier we know about your anticipated harvest, the better equipped we are to Organize as efficient of an inspection as possible for you. Um, so, and, you know, we get a lot of people where if there's a 30 day window. To inspect their crop, uh, they want it right at day 30, not at day 10. We can't guarantee you to hit that day 30 for you because we are um, dealing with, you know, over 100 different folks who are all trying to harvest and get inspected. But again, the sooner you give us notice, the easier it is for us to accommodate you and schedule your inspection as early as possible. Um, this year, you will be inputting your harvest inspection through our new regulatory software. So some of you have probably already um, registered and filled out your applications. Um, and that is the same portal that you'll use to, to fill out what is called a harvest report. And that harvest report will notify us that you are ready to have your crop inspected. Um, and so that is the primary important thing for you to know. And we'll move to our next slide. Yeah, so this is much what I had just said, but I will tell you a little bit about um, what it looks like for the inspector to come to your farm to take the sample. So, um, a WSD inspector is going to come to your farm to take the sample and transport that sample to the lab. So, typically, it's really just helpful for you to be there, ideally, or a representative from your farm to be there the day that they are doing the sample inspection. Um, and it's also important to make sure that, you know, your crops are labeled. You should have a signage on your crops that has our department's phone number and your license number on it. Um, it's really helpful. A lot of you um, live in pretty rural environments. So 
just being available. Um, I know the inspectors will both get on the phone or text with different farmers just to make sure they're going to the right spot and um, they know where they need to be. So once we get that harvest inspection um, request, the, the harvest report, we'll start working with the inspector to schedule a time with you and the inspector. Um, you'll typically kind of coordinate with your inspector for the time and the sample. Um, something that occurred a few times last year is that we had um, farmers who were not pleased with the way in which the sample was being taken. Um, I'm going to say that if you have an issue with the way your sample is being taken, please call me. So that's my phone number right there, 360-584-3711. Um, the way that our, our inspectors are trained to take a sample in the way that the USDA protocol asks them to take a sample, and we can't have any kind of variation between how samples are taken on one farm versus another. It just challenges the integrity of the entire program. Um, if our inspectors feel uncomfortable or if they feel like they're being asked to take a sample in a way that is not in alignment with their training, we are going to make sure that they just leave the farm, no sample taken. Um, so if, if you're having an issue with the way your sample is being taken, please just get on the phone to me. Um, our inspectors are, are not in a place to kind of be doing the Q&A as far as sampling protocol, USDA requirements. Um, we have a lot of questions. If you have questions about like how long it's going to be for your sample or really any kind of questions about what's going on with your process, just get on the phone to me. Um, our inspectors have really hard jobs. They're out there in the heat, in the smoke. Um, and so we want, we don't want to overwhelm them with stuff for questions. Um, I see we have a question. Um, I'm going to work on that question later because it's a little complicated, but I will take that at the end. Um, and on to our next slide. Okay, and so there were new USDA sampling guidelines um, at, for this year, which essentially just means that we're going to be taking the top of the crop, um, the five to eight inches of the top of the crop from the main stem. Um, and so we will continue to take a representative sample ratio based on the field size or the number of plants. Um, so basically that means that like if you are on a very large farm, we'll be crossing over. Um, I, we can go to the next slide actually, Jessica. I think it shows that. Oh, no, I guess it doesn't. Um, I, no, I think we took it out. So we do have a table where it talks about um, the number of samples that, that we try to take, but it really comes down to the size of the field or number of plants. Um, so we can definitely include that when we send it out uh, for folks. It's not a hard and fast thing. It's just making sure that we get a representative sample. Yeah, so will the inspector will kind of cross the farm to make sure that the, they're getting a number of plants that is representative based on the acreage that you've planted and then cut that top of the plant. Um, and then we'll go to our next slide. Great, so um, the sample will go to a laboratory that is contracted with the WSDA. Um, it may take the laboratory up to 10 days to provide results. So um, the, we are currently in the process of figuring out our contracts for the upcoming harvest, but we will let you know prior to um, the harvest, which laboratories that we're working with. Um, that way you know where your sample might be going. Um, typically, what our goal is, is to work with a group of um, testing laboratories that are around the same price point, um, no major discrepancies in price, 
And uh, ideally, we are trying to get the sample to a lab that it is efficient for us to drive that sample to the lab. Because we charge time and mileage for the inspections, we want to bring the sample to the most cost efficient lab as possible for you. We have occasionally gotten people who are very uh, specific where they, they really specifically want their sample to go to a particular lab um, that we are contracted with. We can only bring the samples to labs that we're contracted with. If you really want your sample to go to a lab, to a very specific lab, you can make that clear to us. However, it may cost more to bring your sample to that lab. If geographically it means that we're bringing just your sample somewhere different than the other samples that we're moving around that week. Um, you will be provided with a certificate of analysis that was produced by the laboratory. So the sample will go to the lab and then the lab will send me the certificate of analysis. And then from that certificate of analysis, I produce a THC certificate specifically from the, our hemp program. And so you will then be issued with um, a THC certificate from the hemp program as well as a certificate of analysis from the laboratory. And we suggest that anytime your harvested crop is traveling, that you um, have it travel with those documents, the THC certificate from the hemp program, the certificate of analysis, um, and ideally a copy of your license. Now, I'll just go back to the question that Bonnie Jo asked me. Um, so, how should producers plan ahead to move their crop after it is sampled and harvested for drying or processing while they wait for their fit for commerce certificate? Um, how do they make changes on their application in the future to add a location for drying, processing, and storage? So, when you apply as a hemp producer, there is a map within your um, application and you can pinpoint a location for storage, drying, and processing. So, the only requirement is that you have, um, it, so until you have your THC certificate from us, your crop can't leave your registered area. That means that you can still harvest it and dry it as long as you're keeping it on your registered drying and storage areas that you have registered with us. So when you fill out your application, you are going to put a little pin on where your drying and storage room is. And if we come take your sample and you wanna harvest right away, you can go ahead and harvest as long as you're just keeping it in your registered land area, your drying area, your storage area. So when you're registering your grow areas, it's also really important that you're that you are simultaneously registering your drying, processing, storage facilities, any facilities where you're planning on transporting your crop before you export it, sell it, move it out. Um, that's really important that you have registered with us. And that way, once we take the sample, you can harvest, you can do what you want. Um, and it is still in your registered area as a hemp producer. What I'll say is, once you harvest your crop, you're no longer eligible for a retest. So let's say that you test 0.42. So you're 0.12 over 0.3. If you haven't harvested, then we can come back and take another sample of your crop. Um, but if you have harvested, then you're stuck at that 0.42, which means that you've now moved into your remediation options of like using the bulk biomass that's been mulched or, um, or you know, taking the flowers out. You only have one of those two options if you've already harvested. That being said, once you get, um, once you get sampled, you can harvest your crop. You just need to make sure that it is located on your registered land areas, which certainly can include drying and storage that is available on the application. Um, if you, uh, this is not uncommon in which folks have, uh, 
grown and now they're drying and they're harvesting and they're like, oh my goodness, I have run out of drying space. I need more drying space that I did not previously anticipate. Um, you can actually do a license modification. It costs $200, but you fill out a license modification. And what you can do is you can add a grow location. You can add a drying or storage facility um, at any time in the year. It's just $200 per additional site. So you go back into the software and you input a new address and that way um, those locations are accounted for. Um, so hopefully that handles the question. Um, and I will say uh, the dip, some of the different laboratories do offer rush testing. So if you are really like in a rush to harvest or move this out and you want your, um, your results quicker than the 10 day turn time, then depending on the lab, they might have an option to speed that up. But again, call me with those questions, um, not the inspector. Make sure you give me a call to say, okay, I'm in a bind. This is what I need. Where should we move from here? Um, okay, next slide. Billing and payments. So um, the hemp program is currently a checks only program. You must send a check in the mail for invoices received. Um, Someone calls me probably every day and says, really, are you sure you only take checks? And really, I am sure that we only take checks. I, like many of you, would also probably have to go to the bank to get a check um, because I do not have checks either in this modern world. But unfortunately, in this moment, we only take checks. It is something we're working on. So um, it is our hope that in the future we'll be able to have an online or credit card payment system. It's just not something that we have quite yet. We're still in that government mode of working slowly to try to make some changes. Um, one thing that we ask is that you wait to send us money until you have received an invoice. Um, we get a lot of folks who will send us checks for, I don't know what, because they, <laughs> Don't have invoices attached to them and then we have to figure out what the money is an account for and oftentimes like for example someone will send us a 200 dollars check in the anticipation of their harvest inspection but there will be additional charges related to time and mileage or testing so we'll have to go back and forth several times and it's it's really hard to like make amends with what the total amount is owed so just wait until we invoice you and and send us a check for the full amount when the whole process is complete. Um, licensing costs $1,200 annually and you will receive an email invoice upon completion of your application or renewal. Um, and the sampling and testing fees will depend on your geographic location and harvest date. Um, you will be invoiced for a harvest inspection fee along with time, mileage, and the actual lab testing fees upon completion of inspection and testing. Um, and so I'm seeing how large are flower samples that are taken by the state? Only laboratories only need one gram of dried flour for testing. So we have been told by our laboratories that they actually want a lot more than one gram and part of that is because occasionally we ask for retests a lot of times if they're really close to that point three mark they'll retest on their own because they they certainly don't want to like you, they want to double check um some of times they're doing voluntary testing for pesticides heavy metals and mycotoxins so again they're asking for a little bit more um, the, the size of the sample does in some ways, uh, relate to the size of the farm. So if you have a larger farm, we're just going to have to take more of the sample. But I want to say that our labs were asking for around eight grams last year. I could be wrong. I just, I definitely know it was more than one gram. Um, that they had wanted and and we tend to kind of 
trust their expertise for what they need in alignment with then the amount that um, USDA asks us to sample. And we can go on to the next slide. Teresa, I just want to add a couple things. Um, I think part of the reason why, uh, in addition to what you said, um, that we would want um, and support the labs asking for more than um, one gram would be also that we're providing fresh, uh, fresh material um, that mm -hmm. then gets dried versus you know dried dried material or other types of products that they'd be testing. Um, and we have in the history of the program asked them to retest and picked up part of the sample to, to do testing at our own WSDA lab. So um, having, having them have enough to where we could do multiple tests is definitely something that we need. Um, also, we get a lot of questions around, um, well, we get a lot of concerns around the invoices that folks get when they receive their invoice for inspection and testing. A lot of surprises there uh, because as Tricia, you mentioned folks assume it's going to be close to that $200 um, fee and not realizing it's also time and mileage. And so I just want to I would point out that the program right now is an extremely small program. And because it's a fee for service program, we don't get any um, general fund money from the legislature. So we're required to uh, maintain our expenses through fees. And in order to do that, when you have such a small program, um, you have to have things like time and mileage to make up the cost for bringing on inspection staff. As I mentioned earlier, Tricia is our only full-time employee, um, which is really covered mostly by um, li licensing fees. And so the, the sampling and testing fees outside of the, te the actual lab test fee that we get charged from the lab, when you're getting your, your sampling and your, your time and mileage, you're really paying for the inspector. Um, that we have to hire in order to do the seasonal testing. So um, ideally, if we had, you know, a significantly larger number of participants in the program, we would be able to look at maybe doing away with something like time and mileage. Um, some of our other programs are able to absorb that cost because they have, you know, enough uh, participation in the program to where, you know, licensing would cover something like that. But at this time, the program is so small that we do not have enough. And so that's why you're seeing, you know, a $200 or a $1,200 licensing fee and then a, a processing fee for the uh, for your fit for commerce certificate. And also, you know, that covers scheduling and then time and mileage of the actual inspector. Yeah. Yes, thank you for that. Um, so we're moving on to the part with our new licensing and regulatory software. And just to be honest, it was my intention to kind of go through the software live with y'all, but due to, um, the incredible bandwidth that we are occupying, I don't think I'm going to be able to do that with you, but I am going to talk about it. <laughs> um, and I think that'll still be helpful. Just know that, um, so we've had some people experience what I call kickups with our new licensing and regulatory software. And just be sure to call me on the phone. I am here to help you out in uh, whatever capacity that I am capable of. And when we have issues where we need to like refer up to IT, um, we're able to do that too. But our new licensing and regulatory software is, um, is pretty exciting um, in part just because our program is getting larger. The USDA has a lot of requirements um, related to uh, kind of how we um, provide them with data. And so manually organizing that data was just not working anymore. So having this system means that we will be better equipped to kind of like collect information. For example, I get a lot of questions for you as far as like, what percentage of people are growing for cannabinoid oils versus uh, just for um, biomass or whatever it might be. And those were answers we didn't have in the past. And now we're able to kind of see not just 
how much people are growing, but why they're growing the amount of they're growing, what they're growing it for. So it's going to give us a lot better information about what is going on. Um, so our application for the hemp producer license has moved online. So if you want to be a hemp producer, then you are going online um, to do that. If you go to our website, um, then you will, the WSDA hemp program website, then you will find a link that will take you to the new application. Um, I've had a lot of people call saying that they're trying to log in and uh, they forgot their password. Actually, you've just never had a password. It's a new system. So you have to click the register button below you can below before you can log in. So the first step is to register. A lot of people try to log in and probably like me, you try to use the same username and password that you have for every other component of your life, put in your Netflix password and get rejected. Um, but yeah, you're going to want to register the first time that you use the system. Um, and then from there, you're going to sign in. Um, if you are someone who it has previously been licensed with us, meaning that you and in the program that has existed since the farm bill passed in 2018. So we had some folks who were in our industrial hemp program. Your license would have started with the prefix WAIH. If your license started with the prefix WAIH, then your data was not integrated into our new software system. So you're gonna have to do a completely new application. If you're someone who has the license prefix 53 a number, um, and you had previously been licensed with us, then you should be eligible for, for renewal. Um, what that means is that if you use the email address that you previously had on file with us, then you should, when you register for your account, then you should be brought into a system that has a renewal button as opposed to an application button. So you can actually renew and it will have some of your data stored. Again, in the event that you are using um, the email address that you had used in your previous licensure, starting with the prefix 53, then you will be eligible to renew and some of your information will be kept. Um, other components of the new application system, you will upload your background check. Um, and so in the past, you would email us a background check. Now you upload it. We got the question, um, I gave you my background check last year. Do I have to give it to you again? Yes, the USDA requires a yearly background check. So you will have to give us a new background check that I believe was completed within 60 days of you um, starting your application. So updated background check. Um, there is a new mapping tool that allows you to draw out the outline of your registered land area. Um, and uh, a couple of other things. Um, you can put it, a pin for where your drying or storage area is. Um, so all of those are options for you. Um, I'm trying to think of other components that it is important for me to go over while we are thinking about that application. Um, so, occasionally, people will either have trouble accessing the renewal button or the map on their application. Um, I am, like, the queen of calling IT and then having them ask me if I have restarted my computer, to which the answer is always no. Um, so, what we have found is that clearing your cookies, cache, temporary internet files, whatever that may be called on your browser, is usually uh, the most effective way if you're not having certain buttons show up to have them show up. Um, we find that the application works really well on Google Chrome. So if you have Google Chrome, start there first. And again, clear your cookies, cache, and temporary internet files, and then ideally restart your computer and reopen the browser. And that is the simplest way to work out bugs on the application. 
If you do that and you're still having the bugs, then give me a call and we can talk about what's going on from there. Um, we've had a couple of people try applying from their cell phone. That doesn't seem to work very well. I definitely recommend getting on a computer. Um, and if you're having an issue, give me a call and we can try to work it out. Um, and so from there, um, we are just going to move forward into questions. So if anyone has a question that they want to pop into the chat box, I can try to answer your question. Not seeing any questions yet. Patricia, I think something that would be helpful for us to do um, is maybe you and I, after this, can have, um, can we can record a, a, a webinar where we're just going through the software and then we can post that as well. Totally. Yeah, it was our hope to have the software shareable for you, but it looks like with all of the wonder, wonderful people who have joined us, we just don't have the bandwidth to share it. So we'll create a recording so that y'all can familiarize yourself with, um, with the software. And okay. Yes, annual background checks are needed for all applications, including renewals. The question was, are annual background checks needed for all applications, including renewals? Yes, you must submit a background check yearly. That is a USDA requirement. So they are required. Trisha, I, I, have, I have a couple. Okay, great. Um, so one that we received, uh, a couple of questions specifically around sample sizes. Um, we do have a chart, as I mentioned, that talks about sample sizes. I believe it really highlights um, larger uh, plots. Um, so for folks that have smaller ones, um, I know I got a specific question. We will we will work through that one with that person. Um, but it is it's a fresh weight that we're taking samples from, and then we had a question around is. Is there an average cost of the sampling process? Um, Trisha, you, you're more familiar with the, the invoices that went out than I am. I think we've had some that have been around, you know, $250, $300, and then we've had some that have been, you know, extremely, you know, into the, into the several thousands based on um, the number of samples that, they've, that folks have asked us to take. So something that I don't know if we really touched on was um, you may ask us to take to break up your land into multiple lots for testing. Uh, we have that done quite frequently if folks have um, you know a, a large large acreage with multiple varieties. You may want us to do different testing for each variety, or if you have a section of your your acreage that um, seems to have done better. Um, than others, you may want us to break that up, especially if folks are, are testing uh, above the threshold. We have had some success with narrowing down portions of land that maybe got less sun or um, natural occurrences to, to where that, that piece of, of acreage tests below the threshold and is able to be processed. And then you're only dealing with destruction or remediation for the others. Um, we did get another question here. Uh, is remediation only at the biomass level or is remediation of more processed products, i.e. oil on site possible? Um, yeah, so we as an agency, our, our rules are related to the plant and the crop. Um, there is not any type of distillation or processing option for remediation. Everything that occurs for remediation still has to happen at the plant level. So the plant has to be signed off on before it can like be extracted or anything like that. So no, um, the extraction distillation is not currently an option available as provided by the USDA for remediation. Um, and I'll add on to Jessica's 
uh, response related to costs for sampling and testing. Because, yeah, there's a really wide range of costs depending upon where you live and your samples. And I'll also just encourage people um, just to kind of think strategically about how you want your samples taken. We've had a lot of people who are choosing to like break up their lots um, to a great degree or do a lot of like marketing testing or research and design type testing where folks have, um, you know, reached out to me saying like, I want these 10 tests. I want you to come on September 1st and September 15th and October 1st and October 15th. And what I typically tell folks is that you are welcome to do a whole series of testing that you want to do as a private company. There's nothing stopping you from doing your own testing. Um, please go do your own testing. We need to take a compliance sample. That is something that we have to do. And for the crops specifically that you are intending on, you know, harvesting, exporting, selling, exiting your property, we have to take our compliance sample. Um, but oftentimes it is more cost efficient for you to do some of your own, like marketing or research design sampling or sampling that you do to try to figure out where the crop maturity is at before we come, just do that on your own. Um, so I just encourage you, you know, and feel free to like, give me a call. I've talked this out with many farmers as far as like, what makes sense for you um, for what we should sample and when we should sample it um, versus other sampling you might wanna do just to fulfill your own curiosity. Um, we'll try to come up with like the most cost effective plan that we can um if you know if we have the information um so i'm seeing some more questions jessica um if we grow more than one variety do we need an application for each variety no you don't need an application for each variety and i'm i'm not sure if by application do you mean like uh, growers application or harvest report, but, um, you can grow multiple varieties as a producer. Um, and you also can, um, you also can get your crop. You can get multiple varieties inspected on a single day. You just have to delineate for us, which samples to take from what, but you don't need multiple requests. Um, I have another question. Is there a plan for reduced price for renewals rather than new farmers? No, unfortunately there is an annual licensing fee, whether you are a new applicant or a renewing applicant, the annual licensing fee is $1,200 for all applicants. Um, so for researchers who collaborate with farmers on research on farmers' fields, both researchers and the collaborating farmers need to apply for a license, correct? Um, you know, that's a complicated question, depending on how I read it. What I'm going to say is that folks who are doing research and folks who are doing research that are collaborating with farms just reach out to me so that we can just have a conversation about what your circumstance is, because we don't have that many folks doing it. Maybe it's a handful or two handfuls. So I think it's probably just worth a private conversation to dig through what exactly your circumstance is. Um, I think there are probably some circumstances where it makes sense for researchers to be licensed and others where maybe it doesn't. Um, so I don't want to give an absolute because we just seem to have a lot of nuanced examples of this going on. Um, I see another question. Does Washington have a list of prohibited varieties? No, we don't. Um, at this point, you know, they're like, I know states like Kentucky ha who have been doing this for a bit longer than us have like list of approved or certified varieties and also a list of prohibited. We just don't have enough data yet to um, confidently make those lists. And it also like there seems to be some challenges related to how different varieties or strains are named. 
um, that prevent us from making any kind of prohibited or approved list at any time. Um, hey, Tricia, something, something I'd probably add on that one is the pilot program required uh, folks to use certified seed. And when there was the 2019 legislation, um, it really opened it up to where um, the seed is really uh, on the ownership of the producer um, to take the risk on what type of seed and what varieties uh, you all want to use. So that's been a big driver as well on why we haven't put together a list of approved varieties um, just around authority. Um, so just something there. Yes, very good. Um, okay, I see another question. Is there any oversight by any agency for processing? Is trimming and packaging for retail or shredding and packing cones for smokable considered processing? If not, when after harvest is it considered processing? So that is a layered question. Um, we do not regulate processing at the Washington State Department of Agriculture. So no, there is not necessarily any oversight by any agency for processing. And because there isn't oversight, there also isn't a definition. So saying, but essentially what I let people know is that um, you are interacting with us until you get that THC certificate from us with your COA. And once you receive that THC certificate, um, that's when essentially we exit the process. Uh, you still might come back to us for help with, for example, if you're exporting something, maybe you need a phytosanitary certificate. Um, maybe you need, um, you know, some other assistance as you're exporting. But what you're doing after you get that THC certificate, if you're extracting it, if you are packaging it, if you are um, shredding it, if you're putting it into cones, that is not something that we interact with. Um, I will say that there is a bill right now in the legislature. Um, it's 5372, it's Senate Bill 5372. And it is, I, it has a hearing on Friday, um, and that would allow processors, folks who are processing hemp, to register with us um, at the WSDA, but it's it's truly just a registration and it's voluntary, and what that means is it's twofold, I think. You know, um, right now, oftentimes farmers don't know how to find processors and processors don't know how to find farmers, so this would at least give us a list of folks who choose to register and would probably ease the the connections um, between those two entities. Um, and the other arena in that it might create some ease for us for law enforcement if they are um, entering into a facility where folks have possession of hemp material that can sometimes provide confusion for law enforcement. So if that location was registered, it would, again, ideally ease that confusion, um, but it wouldn't actually, that I don't believe that bill has much to say over the actual actions of processing. Um, it's more just the, the locations of processing. Um, but that bill has a hearing on Friday. It is not yet law. As of now, there is not any oversight um, and Someone said, can you please repeat that bill number? And I do see that Greg Foster just posted to everybody. SB 5372 um, has a hearing on Friday. So, Jessica, do you see any more questions on your end? No, but I did. I, I did have another thing that we probably should talk about. Tricia and I both get a lot of calls uh, from local law enforcement. Um, and so I think it's really important while we're spending a significant amount of time going through and finding, you know, they'll send us an address um, or names. Um, so that can what you all can do to help facilitate some of the struggles that we're having and and law enforcement is having is just making sure that you're following the requirements of posting your license um, where you're where you're registering. 
So there is, um, under our program rules, there is a requirement that you're posting signage on your property where you're growing hemp or where you have it registered so that um, folks, folks know uh, that it's hemp and not marijuana, um, but that also then helps when um, we're getting phone calls from law enforcement and they say, okay, well, here's, they, they have a, a license posted, can you double check? And, and then it's a very easy thing for us to pull up um, and make sure that, that we actually have issued that license. So just something to keep in mind um, because there has been more uh, enforcement activity over the last year since there's been an increase um, in, in hemp and marijuana production. Okay, any other questions? I don't see in here any, uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat, Tricia, but um, something that folks can do, which I'm sure you'll, you'll mention again, um, but there is our hemp, our generic hemp email, hemp at agr.wa.gov, that's on the slide right now. Um, and we can make sure that we're answering any questions you have afterwards as well. Yes. Feel free to ask more questions. Well, I'll just keep this open for a minute or two, but I also won't hold you if you have no more questions. Um, so we did get one, Tricia. Oh, oh, there we go. Um, we got, we have a question. Can a local ordinance prevent hemp from being grown? Um, yes. So we have in the past, had um, county ordinances um, placed restrictions on hemp. Um, we've had a, a couple a couple counties do that. Um, I haven't had the experience since we put our our commercial program together. Uh, I, most of our issues were around the the time period in which we did not have an approved plan from USDA. Uh, but now I don't, Trisha. I don't know if you've received any word from any counties lately that are preventing hemp. The big one may be preventing where within city limits it could be grown, um, but altogether banning it, I'm I'm not aware. Yeah, no, I don't think that there has been any ban. We've definitely gotten some questions from localities who seem perhaps interested in it, but there is nothing um, there is nothing on that prevents anyone in any locality at this moment. Um, and then I do see another question. It's a question actually that I don't know that I have the answer for. Is the age limit for smokable hemp 18 or 21? I know the smoking age for tobacco and vapor products is 21, um, but I'm not sure definitions wise if hemp products are included in that. That's going to have to go on the list of questions that I have to answer later. Um, and then I see another question. Is it correct that the post inspection harvest window was lengthened to 30 days in the final rule, or did I misread that somewhere? No, we did go over that at length earlier today. Uh, the, it's not a post inspection harvest window. It's a pre harvest inspection window. It was lengthened from 15 to 30 days in the final rule. Yes. Pre harvest inspection 30 day window. Um, any more questions? Okay, see no questions. I'm gonna um, put an end to our session here. I wanna thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, we will be working on closed captioning or providing transcripts for this recording and then um, giving it to you so that you can look at it later. Um, and in the meantime, if you have any questions for me, please feel free to reach out at the email address or phone number 
listed and we really look forward to um, hopefully you all will uh, tune in in the future. We still have three more webinars, so I'll be sending out links um, for the three more webinars. Be sure to uh, check us out every Wednesday for the next three Wednesdays. Um, yeah, thank you so much and thank you, Jessica, for your help as well. Have a great day, everyone.